pots and pans. Like, like, like cooking pots and pans. No, they're fighting in pots and pans. I don't follow. Oh, it, it's a place, and that's not its real name. Okay, well, what's its real name? Okay, pots and pans it is. Yep. All right. May 13th, 1944. They have tried and failed, and tried and failed, and tried and failed yet again. For most of the winter and the spring, the Allies have tried to break into the Leary Valley and also knock the enemy off Monte Cassino. This week, they try again. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Soviet attacks began on Sevastopol. At the other end of the world, the Allies finished their successful operations at Hollandia, reopening the airfields. In China, the Japanese took Shucheng. Merrill's marauders force marched over the Burmese mountains. The fighting in India at Impal and Kohima continued unabated. And in Italy, plans were being made for a huge new Allied offensive. We also saw there that 5th Army Commander Mark Clark was furious with Allied armies in Italy Commander Harold Alexander for issuing orders directly to Clark's subordinates. This week on the 8th, Clark confronts Alexander, telling him he's been embarrassed. The meeting ends, though, with Alexander not changing his orders, Plan Buffalo, for the Anzio Beachhead Army to take Valmontone as part of the upcoming offensive, Operation Diadem. Clark writes in his diary, I am thoroughly disgusted with him and his attitude. On the 9th, Clark meets with reporters and goes over Diadem in detail, including that the enemy, under smiling Albert Kesselring, has 412,000 men in 23 divisions in Italy, with nine of them in 10th Army at the Casino Front and five in 14th Army at Anzio Front. Clark does not tell them that the Germans have 326 workable tanks, 616 AA guns, and 180 assault guns. The animating principle behind the initial Allied attack scheduled for Thursday night was simple. Everybody throws everything they have at the same time. At long last, the total resources of both 5th and 8th Army would fall on the enemy simultaneously. The subsidiary attack out of the beachhead would depend on progress in cracking the Gustav line. Clark expected a tortuous grind, with daily progress limited to two miles or less. He assumed that Rome would be despoiled. He does not mention his issues with Alexander, and in fact says that he does plan to cut Highway 6 and points to Valmontone on the map, so he is at least going to follow Alexander's plan. As for Kesselring, his forces are watching both coasts because he believes amphibious invasion is coming because he doesn't have much intel on the Allies at all. 10th Army Commander Heinrich von Wittinghoff says on the 10th that he doesn't expect any real enemy action in the near future, so he goes to meet Hitler in Bavaria. 14th Panzer Corps Commander Fridolin von Senger has been on leave since late April, and still is. And even Kesselring's Chief of Staff, Siegfried Westphal, is on convalescent leave. The remaining German commanders in Italy think some Allied attack will come, like, the 20th, right? Okay, Kesselring is not stupid. He's pretty sure they're also going to attack along Highway 6 at some point, because he thinks that's the only place you can really use armor. And behind the Gustav Line, he's been busy building the Hitler Line, like 10 to 15 kilometers behind it, across the peninsula. H hour 4 diadem, though, is 11 p.m. on May 11th, while all those guys are still away. This is an hour before moonrise, and after a huge bombardment with cries of Rome, then home, the mighty offensive begins. Eighth Army is attacking on the right, where it was mainly the Americans and New Zealanders attacking a few months ago, but now is attacking with twice as much force. Before, it was the 4th Indian Division up Casino, now it's two Polish divisions. Instead of the US 36th Division across the Rapido, now it's two British divisions, with two more to follow them, and behind them, the Canadian Corps. But while they may have had some good luck with enemy commanders being away, they have some pretty bad luck too. When the Poles hit Casino, they face nine battalions of the enemy. See, just tonight, of all nights, the Germans bring in relief for the garrison there, so there are nearly twice as many men at that precise time than otherwise. The Poles fight exceptionally well, but they cannot overcome that much of the enemy. 
At 4 p.m. on the 12th, Vladislav Anders calls his divisions back to their jumping off points. The assault battalions have been roughly halved in strength. But the left wing of the attack isn't exactly having a picnic either. The 8th Indian Division is to cross the Rapido and take Sant'Angelo, but this becomes as much of a killing ground as it was in January when the Americans tried the same. Assault troops splashed and puddled across the Rapido only to trip both anti-personnel mines left five months earlier by the Yanks and smoke canisters emplaced by German gunners as aiming stakes. Visibility dropped to two feet. Men stumped about in flame-stabbed confusion, pitching into ditches and walking in circles. Twelve of sixteen Gurkha boats sank or floated away. Farther upstream, all forty boats manned by a brigade of the British 4th Infantry Division were soon gone. Drowned men drifted on the dark current that had drowned so many before. By noon the 12th, neither the 8th Indian nor the 4th Infantry have made 500 meters, and they've planned for two kilometers by then. They have, overall, secured a few objectives on the left, but none on the right. But, but, a German counterattack to completely sabotage Operation Diadem does not come. See, without Wiedinghoff and Westphal and Zenger, there's a fair amount of chaos in German command, and 10th Army headquarters has been demolished by Allied bombs. Kesselring's command quarters are also hit hard, and what with all the confusion, no counterattack. By 9 a.m. the 12th, there's a bridge over the Rapido. By 11, another one, over which Canadian tanks hurry across, and a third one by this morning, the 13th. On the 12th, Nepalese Gurkhas are hitting Sant'Angelo, and though enemy machine gunners throw them back a couple of times, building by building and block by block, they overcome the defenders, backed by Canadian tanks just outside the village that shoot those enemy who try to get away. They edge towards the entrance to the Leary Valley, the goal, and set up more and more bridges over the Rapido, but unless Casino falls, the ruins of the abbey and the hills bristling with the enemy, Anyone going up Highway 6 is in big trouble. 8th Army Commander Oliver Leese writes, Mark Clark has laid 4-1 to one against our crossing the Rapido. As they say at a private school, sucks to him. On the far left, the two divisions of Jeffrey Key's 2nd Corps try pushing from Minturno, but they too meet withering machine gun fire and 88 fire, and they also have pretty steep ground to try to cover. By this morning, their attack has completely stalled. What about Alphonse Jouin's French Expeditionary Corps, fighting the biggest French army action since 1940? By noon on the 12th, they have hardly moved. Jouin himself goes up Monte Ornito to check out the scene, and then decides to begin again after replanning. He'll send the 2nd Moroccan Infantry Division towards Monte Mayo, a thousand meters high, and his artillery will now act mainly in support of that push. This goes up this morning at 5.30 a.m. The big guns light up the mountain, and the Moroccans charge in, routing the enemy. Monte Mayo is captured by mid-afternoon, and a hole several kilometers wide has been torn in the Gustav line. A tricolor, eight meters by four, is set up on top of the mount, visible from Casino all the way to the coast. For you see, Kesselring has made an error. The German defenses in the Arunchis were thinner than anywhere else on the front. Kesselring was relying on the exceptionally difficult terrain to stop any enemy advance there. He had not taken account of the mountain-bred French North Africans, who were completely at home in such rough country. Those attacks may well break through the enemy, but some other Allied attacks turn out to have been a feint. The Soviet attacks on the north of Sevastopol at the end of last week. The main assault comes this week on the 7th behind Balaclava. By day's end, the Red Army has reached Sapun Heights, and by the end of the 8th, there is just no way the Axis can defend anywhere, really. Army Group South Ukraine Commander Ferdinand Schorner, against Adolf Hitler's orders, orders Sevastopol evacuated the 7th, though Hitler agrees to it the night of the 8th. Evacuation goes on for four nights until the last strong point falls. Soviet commander Fyodor Tolbukhin announces the city's capture to Joseph Stalin already the 10th. By the 13th, all of the Crimea is under Soviet control. Thing is, the Axis evacuation is anything but smooth and 
is kind of a fiasco. A lot of the incoming ships turn back empty, and many only take a few men each. The German Navy says there's too much smoke and, and, and they can't come into shore, and there are whole convoys that don't even try to. So of the 64,700 men in Sevastopol at the beginning of the week, 26,700 of them are now still there and have fallen into Soviet hands. Hitler orders that neither Erwin Janicki nor Karl Almendinger, who each has commanded 17th Army during the Soviet attacks on Crimea, will have another command until after courts martial, since he thinks they did not do all they might have to hold Crimea. A couple of the naval commanders, though, get the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. Well, the Soviet spring offensives have pretty much quieted down. But both sides know they will soon be driving again, especially once the spring floods are over. But where? The German Eastern Intelligence Branch of OKH, who are responsible for actions and planning on the Eastern Front, thinks it'll be one of two options. One, a drive from the Kovel Lutzk line through Warsaw to go behind Army Group Center and north to the Baltic coast. Or two, a drive into Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, and the Balkans. They think, though, that option one requires strategic planning proficiency beyond Stavkas, so they conclude that it will be option two to knock out Germany's allies and enter long-coveted parts of southeastern Europe. North of the Pripyat marshes, things will stay quiet. The Army Group staffs and OKH command agree with this, with two small exceptions. Army Group Center and North Ukraine are a bit concerned with heavy Soviet railway traffic around Koval and Tarnopol. So Army Chief of Staff Kurt Zeisler says, why not take force from Army Group Center and North to create a reserve army that can go into action wherever the big blow falls? This week on the 12th, Eastern Intelligence Branch now says the main attack will be between the Carpathians and the Black Sea, but a secondary attack will aim at Lvov, Lublin, and Brest. So the thinking is that if the rest of Army Group Center's front stays quiet, then the attacks will come at a place easy to fight back. So Zeitzler now wants that reserve army to be a first strike force. The 56 Panzer Corps will form the nucleus of this force. They are on the right flank of Army Group Center. More on this next week. Someone else is having big organizational issues this week. That someone is Chinese Nationalist Commander Chiang Kai-shek, and the problem is organizing some kind of defenses against the Japanese Ishigo operation, particularly those of his two first war zone generals, Tang Enbo and Zhang Dingwen. Chiang actually writes in his journal The Seventh that he thinks Zhang, who moved his headquarters westward without telling either Chang or his own subordinates, did so specifically to prevent anyone from asking him for instruction. I cannot say whether this is true, but thanks to Jiang Dingwen's inability to command his troops in a military urgency, Chang found he had to bypass the Ministry of Military Command chain and give orders directly to Jiang's subordinate officers, thus acting like General Jiang Dingwen's chief of staff and enabling Jiang to shed his responsibility. Chang is mainly concerned this week with the defense of the ancient capital Luoyang, especially after aerial recon the 8th shows some 200 Japanese vehicles making for it from the east. Two days later, Japanese forces from Shangxi cross the Yellow River, so Luoyang is threatened from multiple directions. Chang has the idea of putting together a big armed force southwest of Luoyang and using the city as bait, first weakening the forces attacking the city in a set-piece battle, and then using his regrouped forces to destroy them in a mobile battle outside of it. This is what they did three times at Changsha, and it worked. The big problem with this is putting together that armed force. Tang Enbo is at least trying, but it's just impossible to reassemble his forces when the enemy is facing his scattered units with tanks. Tang failed dismally, but even if he had reassembled his army, he would only have played into Japanese hands, because the Japanese viewed decimating the Chinese field army as far more important than capturing a well-fortified and already isolated Luoyang. The Japanese are, of course, going to attack Luoyang anyhow, and the 3rd Tank Division does so today, the 13th, 
as the week ends. Chang now has generals Wu Tingning and Zhang Shiguang and three divisions defending the city, with Wu and two divisions defending the fortifications of Baimang Mountain and Zhang, the other one in the city. Chang is unable to reach them by telephone. There have been enormous communications failures. Rana Mitter writes that 38th and 13th armies have not received the order to go to the defense of Luoyang and are still following the previous order to head to Yu County. As for Henan in general, remember, they've been suffering from famine, from nationalist army leaders taxing them for grain instead of money because of inflation, as I said the other week, and from a certain segment of that army harassing civilians. Jiang Dingwen will write, During this campaign, the unexpected phenomenon was that the people of the mountains in western Henan attacked our troops, taking guns, bullets, and explosives. They surrounded our troops and killed our officers. At the same time, they took away our stored grain, leaving their houses and fields empty, which meant that our officers and soldiers had no food for many days. Things do not look promising for Luo Yang. In India, at Kohima, where the Japanese siege was broken, Montague Stopford is really throwing units from his 33rd Corps into the fray, though this results in heavy casualties early in the week at both GPT Ridge and Jail Hill. This because the quicker he can drive the Japanese away here, the quicker he can help at Impal to the south. There was a belief in some higher quarters, held in particular by those whose only experience of the terrain came from reading a map in the comfort of a headquarters tent in the rear, that 2nd Division's offensive lacked pace. These accusations were preposterous to the hard-pressed men on the ground. It was impossible for commanders and staff officers in the rear who could not see the ground to understand how a small piece of jungle-topped hillside could absorb the best part of a brigade, how a small group of well-sighted bunkers could hold up an advance until every single one of them had been systematically destroyed, how only medium artillery could penetrate the roof of a Japanese trench, how only direct and short-range sniping by Lee Grant tanks was guaranteed to defeat a Japanese bunker, how the desperate terrain, incessant rain and humidity led even the fittest men to tire quickly, and what an extraordinarily determined opponent they faced. With few exceptions, the Japanese gave in only when they were dead. Every conscious man who could lift a weapon fought until he collapsed. This is why the Japanese still hold all the important ground they've taken since April 4th, but their defenses are slowly being eaten away piece by piece through Allied perseverance. No sudden gains, but gains. GPT Ridge is cleared by the 11th, as is Jail Hill. FSD Hill by the 12th. They are consolidated by the end of the week. And they finally manage to get a tank on the tennis court, allowing the infantry to close in on the bunkers. The southern edge of Kohima Ridge is now in Allied hands, and the Lee Grants can finally hit the road and try to clear the rest of it. At Impal, the fighting continues for Nintho Gong, though the Japanese have by now advanced to a village just three kilometers south of Bishanpur called Potsangbam, which, as sure as night follows day, the British call Pots and Pans. The Japanese are well dug in with anti-tank guns and water-filled anti-tank ditches, so the British cannot use tanks to get them out. We'll see what happens there soon enough, for with a couple of notes, this week is finished. On the 9th in Stockholm, the British manipulate the Swedish stock exchange so that Norwegian stocks go up around 20% to give the impression that Norway is about to be invaded and not France, or not just France. That same day, German naval boss Karl Dönitz tells Count Oshima, the Japanese ambassador in Berlin, that the Allies will not be able to invade for some time. This message is received and decrypted today at Bletchley. On May 12th, American planes launch a big attack on German synthetic oil plants. They bomb seven plants this day, which produce more than a third of Germany's synthetic oil, on which Germany grows ever more dependent. 800 bombers are sent in, and they are only met by 80 fighters, but they shoot down 46 bombers for 30 lost of their own, according to Martin Gilbert. Three of the plants are hit badly enough to be temporarily shut down. And that is the week seemingly endless fighting at Kohima and Impal, 
chaos for Chiang Kai-shek in China, the enemy knocked out of Sevastopol, but certainly not Monte Cassino, and all the Allied attacks in Italy failing, except those of the Algerians, Moroccans, and Berbers, who finally break a hole in the Gustav line. But what does that mean? If they can't exploit it, then it means ever more bloody and deadly attacks on a front that was not supposed to be this tough. And what about Clark and Alexander? What will Clark do if some force not commanded by him approaches Rome? He is very single-minded on that, and he does believe his allies are out to get him. Of course, they might never get anywhere near Rome. At this point, it depends on the North Africans. Just wanted to interrupt for a second. A little while back, I tried to do a shout out to someone who's helped us a lot, and because of autocorrect, or else just me somehow messing up the name and I would not rule that out. It did not work out as intended. So I want to fix that now. Big kudos to Dirk Bergdorf. Everybody, Dirk Bergdorf, woo! woo. That's you guys, woo, okay. Dirk Bergdorf and his team of independent researchers at the National Archives in Washington. That is Dirk, not Dick Bergdorf. That was the problem before. They have helped us big style with some of our map research. Dirk can also help individuals researching family histories, but he specializes in American and German military documents anywhere from unit diaries to maps, aerial photography, and just a lot more. The website is AAA Research naraexpert.com, and there's a link in the pinned comment. So thanks, Dirk, and now I'm gonna take you back to me. And me, continuing to bring you this week-by-week -week story of the war, depends on the Time Ghost Army, for that is what finances it. You can join the army and be part of this at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. These are the newest officers in the army, and the army member of the week is Cheslav Grochulski. Grochulski, Marek? Grochulski. Grochulski, thank you, Marek. Ladies and gentlemen, Marek Kaminsky. Applause. Okay, and speaking of North Africans, we covered the war in Africa from beginning to end as it unfolded, including quite a few specials. And you can go and check out this one about desert warfare. And do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.